So what happened was is we started doing that. And so we collect data from hospitals around the state of Michigan and we make that available to researchers. Um, but we're not here to talk about that today. We're here to talk about security. And we're going to kind of go through some tales, and then we're going to focus on Drupal, but this really doesn't just apply to Drupal. This applies to anything on the web. Uh, so if you're not running Drupal and you've got a WordPress site, I know this is a Drupal camp, and it's bad to say WordPress is a Drupal camp, but... Um, we're open source. We're open source. So we should start off with a definition of what security is, or at least a definition. There's no... There's no like be-all, end-all definition that I typically use, but the CIA triad, which has nothing to do with a government agency by the same name, uh, is a decent explanation for one way to think about security. And we think about this in terms of availability of a system, integrity of the data, and confidentiality of the data. So is the system available? Is it suffering a denial of service attack? Is it online? Is it functioning? Can you access it quickly? Is the data, do you believe that the data is accurate? If it says that somebody is in the fifth grade, are they truly in the fifth grade? And is the data that's supposed to be confidential actually confidential? Um, and so this, these are one of the ways that we think through security. There's a lot of different definitions for security, um, but this is one way to kind of think through it. Uh, there's a lot of research done on these three uh, points. You know, it's a little bit like the project management triangle. You can have two really easily, but not the third. Uh, it's really easy to keep something, uh, keep the integrity and the confidentiality of something if you make it not available. Just unplug it from the internet. Most secure site ever. Um, you know, one of the interesting things here is that the FBI, that's some horrible contrast on this yeah. projector. I apologize. I will read this slide to you even though I hate reading slides to people. Uh, the FBI notes that cyber terrorism attacks are uh, eclipsing um, terrorism as the primary threat facing the U.S. 75% of small businesses and medium businesses surveyed reported cyber attacks, which is great. That just means that the other 25% are doing it right? No. It means the other 25% don't have the technology in place to know they are being attacked. Um, if you have a site on the Internet, it is being attacked. Here. Guess I'm going to stand now. Um, so, if you have a site on the internet, it is being attacked. Uh, a single breach in 2010 reported 38 terabytes of data stolen. For comparison, that's twice the size of all the volumes in the Library of Congress. Companies collect an amazing amount of data on people, and it getting stolen or breached, depending on what data you're collecting, could have legal implications, it could have embarrassment implications, all sorts of issues. So, getting hacked is trendy. Everybody does it. Um, and here are some, we've seen this, I think this, this has not been updated recently, uh, but you can see this is the, the size of the bubble is the size of the breach that occurred. And so, and what's missing from here, of course, is the Equifax hack, uh, which, you know, should be there. Uh, yeah, it just covers the page, yes. How, how big would that be compared to those? <laughs> so, I, I actually don't like this, I don't like this, I, I like the graph because it's showing a, a diversity of sites that are getting compromised, but the, the, what, what's different here is that it doesn't matter the number of records, it's what's in those records. As a hacker, I'd rather have 10,000 great records of data than you know, 25 million records that just have usernames and passwords. So the Equifax breach, it had social security numbers in it. It's an identity thefts like thieves, like you know, gold rush. So it's a little bit unfair if you ask me to say, let's look at the number of records, but um, it's the value of those records. Those records are very valuable. Uh, and, you know, what, what's ironic there is one of the things here actually covers how that got compromised. Um, Taylor Swift's got to be in every, uh, every presentation, maybe cats. So we're going to get in today to three tales. Um, and these are, and then we're going to kind of talk about the security team itself, and then we'll talk about best practices. Um, I should start off by saying that 
These are all true stories. These are not made up. These are actual things that happen to people in the real world, either through Michigan or maybe through the Drupal security team. I have changed significantly in some instances, have changed the, like, the, 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 the characters, the site names involved. I've anonymized this because people don't want the fact that they, their sites got compromised to become public. Uh, so what we've done is we've slightly changed this around a little bit so that you can't figure out who who these stories are of. Uh, I can tell you what one of them is at one point if you want, but for the most part these are all, the, actually for all of them, they are actual real stories of actual sites that actually got compromised. Are there any questions before we get into this? I know I shot through that intro, but okay. There, there will be time at the end for questions. So we have the Red Ribbon Hacker. The Red Ribbon Hacker is about a wonderful person by the name of Myrtle. And she really is a nice person. And she runs this, this shoe store. It wasn't really a shoe store. Um, and she basically gets orders online. She then fulfills the orders in her home, in her small business. Goes to USPS, puts a tracking label on it, sends out the package, and her customers are happy. Pretty simple thing. And... She, when she built her store initially, she was actually really careful about something, about something known as PCI. How many people familiar with the term PCI? That's impressive. So PCI is the requirement standards that you have to be compliant with to take credit card payments. And what she did is she made sure that when her site was built, it was PCI compliant. And I, we're going to get into a little bit of detail on how that happens. And so, you know, what Myrtle did, true story, is she actually would tie a red bow around every one of the packages she sent out. And her site came online on November 15th, 2012. It gets about 3,000 orders per month, about 100 to 200 bucks an order. Um, and the dev shop that built it didn't really provide support after they did it. They kind of said, well, okay, we'll build you a site. Here's the total to build your site. Here's your site. We put it on XYZ's cloud platform. Goodbye. And so I don't know if anybody's had experiences where they kind of contract to have a site built and then the shop just kind of goes away. Um, and of course, the shoe store didn't really have a full-time web person on staff. So on March 11th, 2013, a little bit after a year the site had been online, Merle logged into her bank account and noticed that there was no money going into her bank account. She wasn't actually getting money. Hmm. She called the credit card company, and the credit card company told her, her processing company, told her, you haven't seen any orders in two weeks. And so she's like, well, this isn't right. So she went online, and she placed an order on her own website with her own credit card. Oops. And everything worked the way it should. She got the order notification saying that the order went through. Everything came through as it should have. And she's just like, well, this isn't right. What happened to all the money she was getting? And so Myrtle called a website security expert named Jordan Baker, and he found that the shoe store's payment gateway URL was not pointing to where it should. And so the way PCI, the way they had implemented PCI compliance, and you've seen this workflow a lot, is user goes through your site, they choose a couple products, they put them in their cart, they then go to another page and they enter in their address, their telephone number, their shipping information. They get a shipping quote. They say, yeah, I want that next day air service. And then they say, like, continue to payment. And then they're actually redirected to another website, whether it be Square or Authorize.net or uh, Stripe. They get redirected to another website. Sometimes it comes up as, like, an interstitial JavaScript pop-up. But either way, the actual credit card number itself is not being entered into their server. When you post that credit card data, it doesn't go through their server. That's one easy way to reduce your risk and make things easier on PCI compliance. But there's a problem. Oh, and then they pay, so they enter in their credit card number, the expiration date, maybe they reconfirm their billing address, they press submit, Stripe, authorize whoever it may be, comes up and says, yep, that's a valid transaction, and then it redirects you back to the original site and basically says, yep, Transaction, you know, 225156, paid 150 bucks, here's the confirmation number. And so in your database, in your Drupal.org, in your Drupal database, not Drupal.org, uh, it comes up and it says, you know, transaction order number, blah, 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 had this approval code. And you can actually call your credit card processor and give them the approval code and look up the transaction. That's how it's supposed to work. 
What happened was is that the shoe store's URL was not pointing to the correct gateway. It actually had the same gateway. It had a different merchant account number in there. So someone had created another account and was basically taking the money from Myrtle and processing it. Well, that, that's not good. So what had happened was is Jordan lit a cigarette. He narrowed his eyes and he began reviewing those server logs. And there was a post request on the page to change that URL, and it was from Myrtle's computer. So according to the web server logs, Myrtle actually changed her own payment gateway URL. And you're sitting there thinking, well, why would she do that? That's a really good question. Why would she hack herself? You know, she's a small business. It doesn't make sense for her to, you know, do this. Maybe like a disgruntled employee might want to do it, but she doesn't have any disgruntled employees. She doesn't even have employees. So something was bothering uh, Jordan. He dug some more and he discovered that someone had used a security vulnerability in Ubercart and added JavaScript into a field. And normally what would happen is when, you know, an untrusted entity like a user on your site puts JavaScript into a field, Ubercart comes up and it, it escapes it. It basically says, you know, we're not going to actually process that JavaScript. Um, we're going to ignore the JavaScript. We're going to, you know, we're going to either get rid of the JavaScript or we're going to make it go away. But because of a vulnerability in Ubercart, it wasn't actually patched. And so when the attacker put their JavaScript in, the JavaScript executed, and it ran and it changed their way. And so what Jordan did is he took out his notebook and he wrote down the case of the Red Ribbon Hacker. And you know, one of the things that comes out of this is, there's two things that come out of this. When the Drupal security team releases a security update, you should install it. Don't delay. Just install it. Sometimes that's harder than others, but for the most part, you should install the updates. But also, cross-site scripting, XSS as it gets abbreviated, is hard to understand, and it can do a lot of damage. Cross-site scripting is basically any untrusted user being able to write JavaScript code. And what that allows them to do is act within the browser. So, and there's other, there's a, there's a bunch of different types of cross-site scripting, but for the most part, it's untrusted users writing JavaScript code that runs within the scope of the browser. And where that gets dangerous is if they can somehow run JavaScript code as an administrator. So they themselves don't have admin privileges. They're an untrusted user. But take this scenario. Uh, you run a large academic website. You allow users, let's say students, on that website to make profiles. You say you trust your students, so you give them that full HTML input filter because you want them to be able to put images and change the fonts and whatnot on their profile pages. Your students don't have admin privileges. And in fact, you're so paranoid about security, you blocked admin privileges to one IP address <coughs> on that website. I don't know why you would do this, but let's just go for it. But because you're giving students full HTML, what you can actually do is a student can email you and say, hey, I, I wrote some HTML in my profile, and it doesn't work. Can you help me fix it? OK. So you log into your one computer with admin access. You pull up their profile page, and the JavaScript code that they put in that field executes. Except it's not executing as the student. It's executing as you, the admin. That JavaScript code has full admin access. Anything you can do, it can do. So JavaScript is, is a, is a is, you know, letting untrusted users have access to full HTML or in other ways run JavaScript, really, really bad. The other thing that also comes out of this is storing important information in a file, like settings.php or settings.local, as opposed to putting it in the database. The database can easily be changed. Hopefully your file system cannot be. If this, if that, if the uh, if the authorized.net keys were stored inside of settings.php, even if they got access to run JavaScript, they wouldn't be able to change that file, at least not nearly as easily. So the next one, this is one of my favorite stories, um, and we'll I'll get into why in a second. Um, this is Harper's LLC, which is a small web development company in upstate New York, and it's based out of this gorgeous old house and. You know, it's a four or five person team and they had just gotten a new client and they went out and they bought a domain for this client to build their website. And their, their, uh, 
They, they, they blocked the new domain to the developer's workstations inside that office. So only the people inside the office can get this domain because the company didn't want the website public before they were ready to launch it. And the site got hacked. And, you know, to, 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 to give a little bit more detail, brand new domain name. This was running WordPress. Sites, plugins, and WordPress core were all up to date. The site was a simple brochure type with only one admin account. And the site was set up on a new development server dedicated just to Harper's dev sites. And so whether it's WordPress or Drupal doesn't matter. It could be WordPress core is all up to date. <coughs> or Drupal core was all up to date. All the plugins were up to date. The site was brand new. And so on the third day of developing the site, Jeremy, the content manager, was going to set up some menus. He stopped in horror. The site had porn all over the front page. Jeremy was not happy. And here's the obligatory cat picture. Jeremy called Gene, the in-house IT person, who began looking at the logs to determine how an up-to-date Drupal site, okay, it switched from WordPress to Drupal quickly, how an up-to-date Drupal site got compromised. <laughs> Continuity for the win. Um, on a gray and windy day at Harper's house, she pulled the access logs, and she had only found known and trusted IP addresses internal to the company had gone to the site. So Jean had no idea what happened, and she restored a backup. Okay, we'll move on. Fluke, ghosts in the machine. Two days later, Jeremy went to the site. More porn spam, and he had lost all of his work. This is a naked cat. It's a shaved cat. So, okay, what's going on here? Well... Gene looked in the logs, same IP addresses. So Gene's like, yeah, let's run a virus scan on all the computers that had accessed the site. Well, scan was clean. Gene had no idea what was going on and threw her hands in the air and basically said the site was haunted. Ghost cat. <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess as to what's going on? I'll entertain anything. Compromise module? So, compromised module isn't a bad thought, actually, especially with Drupal 8 and Composer everywhere. Getting, comprom getting compromised code to run on a Drupal site is actually a lot easier given the dependency chain we pull in, but that's actually not what was happening here. Some yeah. sort of outgoing connection getting compromised. An outgoing connection is a great one, and I've seen that, but that's not what was going on here. Let I'll give you one more. Remote access to, to the PC that, that was whitelisted on the IPs. So you're, you're getting closer. So how many people host their own sites? Not using an Acquia. They, they have a server someplace. How many people host more than one site on the server? So, <laughs> so what Gene didn't know is that by default, PHP, FPM, or Apache will run as a single user. That user has access to read all the files uh, for all the sites on the system. Think about this. You've got five sites, you know, you've got like var, dub, 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 data, slash, you know, site one, slash site two, slash site three. You have one instance of Apache running. Apache, when a user hits Apache, it hits the name-based virtual hosting, and it figures out what site to read, and it starts rendering the files. By definition, Apache has to be able to read all of the sites. It may not be able to write to the file system, but it's got to be able to read all the PHP files because it's got to be able to render the site, which means that Apache can read settings.php, which means Apache knows your database credentials, which means if you can compromise one site on the server, you can compromise any of the other sites on the server. Um, so, and that's what happened. Somebody actually had compromised another WordPress site on the server. And they then went through the file system in the actual story, went basically looped through the file system. The server was hosting 20 sites. And they found files named wp-config and settings.php. They executed them in PHP to get the database connection strings out of them, and then connected to the databases directly to inject spam into the sites. So they were very quickly able to loop over all the files in the file system, find these files, and then hack databases in them. Um, when it comes down to single sites, you know, one of the things that we have to think about here is that our, our surface area isn't just Drupal. We can have the most secured Drupal site there is, 
We can have two-factor enabled. We can have all these wonderful things running on this Drupal site, but if our operating system isn't secured, if our physical servers aren't secured, if we've got out-of-date components like Apache or PHP, it doesn't matter how good Drupal's been secured because your surface area isn't just your Drupal site. It's everything running in your stack from your client from your client device that's accessing the stack all the way to the server that the stack is running. So when you're thinking through this, you know, you can do a great job as a developer or as a site builder installing modules that help secure your site, but if your server isn't configured correctly, it doesn't matter how well your site is configured, how well your site is stored, because you, people can still access it using one of the other things. We had the meltdown vulnerability recently uh, that can leak credentials. We had the shell shock vulnerability a year ago. There's all sorts of ways that if your operating system itself isn't secure, it doesn't matter what you've done in Drupal land. Um, shared hosting is cheap for a reason. And when I sh say shared hosting, I'm not just talking about insert vendor's name here who's known for good, cheap shared hosting. I mean, if you're running one server in your organization, you have five websites on it, that is shared hosting. And it's cheap to do that. It's cheaper to do that than, say, running five servers or paying a real company, I shouldn't say real company, paying a company who focuses in hosting to do it because it's, it's, it's cheaper, it's easier. You can just set up a Linux box, but then you have these issues. So you know, if you're going to run your own servers, configure PHP FPM to do use privilege separation or use another mechanism for doing it. There's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, and that's outside of the scope of this presentation, obviously, but if you're interested, you know, you can Google it or talk to me afterwards. Um, but the other thing that's important out of this story that, that's, that's useful to know is if you've got a site that's been compromised, don't bring it back, back online until you've figured out how it got compromised. It will only get compromised again. So when Gene basically said, eh, I don't know what happened, but whatever, let's get it back online so we can keep developing the site. For, you don't know what happened there, but if they found a way to compromise it once, if you haven't fixed that mechanism that they used to get in, someone will get into it again. Uh, don't, don't do that unless you actually know for sure how the site got compromised, because maybe the next time they won't make their compromise so obvious. They'll add a hidden account, they'll change a file on the file system. You won't necessarily know that it's been compromised until it's too late. Um, tale of the poisoned update. This is a shorter tale. This is a library. Nonprofit raises money to buy books for local libraries. Site got compromised and a PHP shell script was updated. All of the modules on the site were up to date. Drupal core was up to date. There were no known vulnerabilities that, you know, weren't, or no unknown vulnerabilities that someone might have used to attack the site. But someone was able to upload a PHP shell script. Uh, the head of their web team was able to actually find the shell script that was used and look at what they did. It kept a history file. It was a pretty useful tool. Uh, they used it to download a copy of the user's table. The user's table contains usernames, email addresses, and this was Drupal 6, so hashed passwords. Um, and not even very well hashed passwords. The script may have been able to mo uh, download more parts of the database, um, but the only the attacker just left behind the users table. Uh, the, user, the table had about a million users in it, so it was not a small site. Um, since they had access to the PHP, the PHP script was running as PHP, so they were able to access anything on the file system, including private file systems. They could, you know, look at Etsy past WD if they wanted to. They could just run commands as the user account that the web server was running as. Um, it also allowed the attacker to just run random MySQL statements. So PHP shell scripts are dangerous for a lot of reasons. The question is, how did this get on there? And the answer was, there was a library removed from a module update. But when Jack downloaded the new module, he didn't actually remove the old module. He just dragged the new module on top of it using an SFTP client. So, you know, if you've got a module directory, my module, and inside of it you've got my module.info, my module.module, and you've got, you know, third-party library, which is a folder. 
And it turns out that there's a vulnerability in that third-party library. What happened was is the module updated itself to remove the third-party library. So when you downloaded that tarball of the new module, in it was just mymodule.info and mymodule.module, and the third-party library folder was gone. But what Jack did is he just dragged the folder on top of it. It replaced the .info file, it replaced the .module file, but it didn't delete the directory that had that vulnerable third-party library in it. Oops. And that third-party library in it actually was where the source security issue came from. And so when you're updating your libraries, your modules, your themes, you want to make sure that all of the old files get removed. And so the easiest thing to do is del put your site in maintenance mode, delete the directory, and upload a new directory. If you use Drush, it does this for you. It doesn't put your site in maintenance mode, but it will actually remove the directory before adding the new directory. The other thing you want to be a little careful of is making sure that PHP will not execute code from, from, uh, from sites anything files. So if you go to your site's default files directory and you do like info.php and you do a one-liner that's like PHP info function semicolon and you go to your web browser and you run that and it shows you the PHP info page, you have a security issue because I can then find a way to upload files into that directory. By, by proper configuration, the web server has access to that location to upload files. And if I can somehow find a way to trick it to uploading a PHP file, it will execute. Um, there's a module, we'll get into this in a little bit, the module called the Security Review Module, which kind of helps figure some of this out, uh, written by a bunch of security team members. So, we're going to go back to 2014. <laughs> Um, how many people were working with Drupal in 2014? About half the room. So in 2014, there was a vulnerability in Drupal uh, called SAO5, Drupal Geddon, however you want to refer to it. And it was really bad. It was the worst, the single worst vulnerability. How many people had a site compromised due to this? Three sites. <laughs> nice, Jim. Um, and so I bring this up now, not because I want to go relive history. This was a very dark time in my life. Um, but because what actually happened during that time is important. Uh, SQL injection is the easiest vulnerability out there to exploit. Um, most of the time, other vulnerabilities either require a lot of time to figure out, and that time isn't necessarily repeatable, or they require people to do things. So like the cross-site scripting vulnerability I talked about earlier, you have a, you know, a, a malicious student who edits a profile. The only way that's valuable is when the malicious student gets an admin to go view their profile. So there's a timing factor there. They've got to you know, try to get the admin to view their profile. It's not instant. Uh, SQL injection, you create a specially crafted post request and you send it to a site and you're either successful or you're not. And you know that within two seconds. And so what was happening here was you could compromise enormous number of sites really quickly. Uh, this, of course, is a wonderful, wonderful uh, way to compromise sites. And people took advantage of it. Uh, we learned a lot by this happening. And so you know, what, what does this let you do with SQL injection? Well, pretty much anything. If an attacker has access to the database that Drupal has. It allows an attacker to modify user roles, change passwords, change email addresses, update the URLs to payment pages, edit content. Anything that can be done in the web interface, that attacker can do. Anything Drupal can do to itself, the attacker can now do because they have access to and more. And they have access to the, your database. It is a serious vulnerability. If your site is poorly configured and you allow Drupal to edit its own file system. In other words, you can upload modules from within your site. This is how WordPress works by default. The attacker can actually edit the code that's running Drupal, which is a lot worse than just being able to modify the database because they can put back doors in there that you may never find. Um, one of the interesting vulnerabilities that happened here is some of the time they would go in and just change the admin's email address. Nothing else. So, you know, you have admin... Typically, at most organizations, there's an admin account. It was created when the site was built. It probably isn't the account you're using every day. 
And so they would just change the admin user's email address, not change the password, just the email, and do nothing, especially at larger companies. Well, what would happen is you would go and patch the site, you'd look around, and you would notice that the site didn't appear to be compromised. A month later, three months later, five years later, they do a password reset. And that password reset email would come to their email address because they changed the admin uh, user uh, admin email address. So this is a um, look at, we basically released the patch here. And right in here is when it actually started taking place. What is this actually showing? Well, eight hours. Security team released the patch for this issue, and eight hours later it was being actively compromised, meaning if you did not update your site within eight hours, your site was likely compromised, such as Jim's were. Uh, and what's interesting to us is the security team was looking at the attack pattern. What were people doing to compromise these sites? And so changing the passwords or emails, they actually injected code into the menu router table and executed file put contents through the menu router so they could visit a hidden URL, which would then save something to the file system. They just add a user and give it a backdoor act and give it admin access. That was a you know a common one. Uh, they'd install a PHP backdoor by enabling the PHP module and then just creating a node with PHP in it. Pretty easy. The fun one is they patch the vulnerability. <laughs> so I would you know I was it was a little busy time for me. I'd get a call. Hey Michael, thank you for patching our site. Who's this? It's XYZ department. What site? URL. I didn't patch that site. Oh, well, we tried to apply the patch and it said that it had already been patched. Huh. So what was happening is an attacker would get in, they'd realize that the site might have valuable information and they wouldn't want anybody else to get into the site. So they would patch the site to prevent other people from compromising it. <laughs> uh, for a short period of time, the security team debated writing a bot that would basically go through and patch all the sites we could, and then decided that would probably get us into some type of legal trouble and we weren't going to do it. But we, we, we debated doing it. Um, you know, the, the, the irony here is that Drupal's database API, if you use it correctly, prevents almost all SQL injection. If you look at like the top web vulnerabilities, the open web source application project, uh, web security one, OWASP basically you know, ranks web vulnerabilities. The top one is injection. The top one for Drupal is cross-site scripting. Why don't we have so many injection issues? Because our database API is great. It's an awesome tool and it, it, you know, if you use it correctly, you don't have SQL injections, unlike a lot of other software. Unfortunately, the actual vulnerability was in the uh, database layer. And here's the patch. It's a one-line patch. Um, and so, you know, when you think about this, it's like, holy bleep. Like, this was a big deal, and it was a big deal. It's got a lot of news cover coverage um, at the time. It was scary. You know, you had we had an issue in Drupal that, you know, every site was vulnerable to, and if you didn't patch your site within eight hours, it was likely compromised. A lot of people spent a lot of time cleaning up. Um, but let, let's keep in mind that the last major vulnerability before this was seven years before it, in Drupal 5. It was nowhere near as serious. That the code for this, this came out with Drupal 7.32. Code for this had been in Drupal since Drupal 7 beta. Like, it had been in there for a long time. And nothing is 100% secure not even unplugging it. And so we mitigate risk by using best practice. And so let's talk about some best practices. Um, so, personal hygiene question, everybody. Did you brush your teeth? Twice a day? Three times a day? Four times a day? Okay. So some people brush their teeth after every meal. Some people brush it when they get up in the morning and when they go to bed. Some people brush it at night before they go to bed or maybe once in the morning. Not every day, but you know, at least once a day. Some people brush their teeth every other day. But for the most part, you fall into one of those categories. If you don't, you probably want to go see a dentist now. Um, 
I think everybody would agree that brushing your teeth is a best practice. We brush our teeth because our, our teeth because we don't want all the issues that come with bad teeth. And it's the same with security. Security is not a checklist. It's not a, hey, we're about to launch our site. Let's go through this security checklist. Security is a process. It is an ongoing, reoccurring uh, thing you have to do. You know, for most groups, uh, they put it in their sprint cycle. You know, you have your QA, and part of QA is doing a security review. When you're going to go download that new module and use it, what security vulnerabilities might it introduce into your stack? When you go and you're going to set up a, um, you're going to go and you're going to set up a, a, uh, a, you know, a new tool, a new site that is going to introduce a wider risk area for your team or for your projects. And so there has to be an evaluation of that. It's not just, hey, we're done. We, or, you know, we're about to disengage with this vendor. Let's go launch the site. And as a result, you know, we do our security checklist. Then we don't do a security checklist again. That would be bad. Um, brushing your teeth is the same way. I'm sorry. Failure to brush your teeth. <laughs> said I'm sorry. Failure to brush your teeth. We know what the consequences look like. We have a very visual indication of what happens when you don't brush your teeth. We are all, that's why we all brush our teeth. We know bad things happen. Not following a daily, weekly, sprintly process with your site, and your site ends up looking like this. Um, the security team comes in, this is out of order, I apologize. Open source security teams follow responsible disclosure to help keep your site secure. And for the most part, what happens is a vulnerability gets discovered in code, sometimes by it's a site maintainer, sometimes it's a security researcher, sometimes it's an accident. It gets reported to a security team, which basically comes and validates that there is an issue. It confirms that they're going to fix the issue with a public process. Um, and so, you know, for Drupal, if you're, you've you got to have a stable module with a stable release, this to be opted into security team coverage. Uh, the security team and the maintainer of the project will fix the issue. So maintainer gets asked, to, hey, there's an issue here. They propose a patch. The security team reviews the patch. A security advisory will then get written. And then on a Wednesday, we will publish all of this at the same time. We publish the code. We publish the new release. We publish the security advisory. And then we send out a bunch of announcements via RSS and email and when the Twitter bot's working Twitter. Um, this is the general process that most open source security teams uh, go through. And Drupal follows this process as well. Um, we follow this process because it's predictable. Mm. Site maintainers, site builders, developers know that on Wednesday, around noonish Eastern time, give or take three hours, uh, we will release updates that may or may not impact your site. And so if you're following, if you're paying attention to this, you will get those updates. You can decide that you need to apply them, and you can move on with keeping your site up to date. And so we follow this responsible disclosure policy. You'll notice that the recent meltdown issues, this wasn't followed. Uh, with Meltdown and Spectre, what happened there is they had agreed upon a date and everything got released four days early. And so vendors weren't ready with their patches because they had planned on and had built into their sprint cycles when they were going to release it. And somebody released all the information early, which really caused headaches. Uh, we were slightly worried about this with SA05. Uh, when SA05, the SQL injection issue came out, you know, we, we were working with people and we were worried that it might get leaked early. And one of the things that we were ready to do was to do an emergency release, if we had to, at another point in time, if that became necessary, if it came out early. Uh, and, you know, that, luckily for us, it was a one-line patch. It's a really easy thing to fix. Uh, you know, we still don't have a good fix for Meltdown and Spectre, and we probably won't until they fix the CPU hardware. So, OWASP which is the Open Web Application Security Project, basically ranks um, security vulnerabilities in this order. Uh, Drupal mostly has issues with cross-site scripting, uh, access bypasses, and components with known vulnerabilities, and then there's some security misconfiguration. You will notice that SQL injection, and it's LDAP and OS, but it's really SQL injection, is the number one issue on the web. 
Now, the reason for this, by the way, is if you go Google PHP and MySQL, almost every example you find is vulnerable to SQL objection. Almost every example you find. In Drupal, our database APIs, dbquery, dbinsert, dbupdate, if you use them and you follow our documentation, you don't have to worry about SQL injection. We take care of that for you. It's one of the advantages of using a framework. <coughs> um, you know, this is this hopefully is a like obvious statement here. Uh, you should only use encrypted protocols. These are normally things with S's on the end. Uh, HTTPS. If you're running a site with HTTP and it doesn't have HTTPS enabled, stop. Install Let's Encrypt. Turn on HTTPS. Turn off HTTP, and come back. I'll wait five minutes. I'm kidding, but seriously, it's really easy now with Let's Encrypt to do this. Um, it's free. Uh, there's no reason not to have a secured site. If you're logging into your site with FTP, please find a different provider. Just, just, just don't even try to fix it. Just find a different provider. Um, as I said earlier, your every change you make might impact the security of your site. Uh, you should be putting some type of security review in your workflow. It is a process by which, you know, your your small change here might have massive changes from a security perspective. Um, use supported versions of both modules and core. If you're running a Drupal 6 site, there is no security team support for Drupal 6 or any of its modules. Yes, you can, you can find uh, third-party vendors. In fact, there's one at this conference. I, nah, maybe not. Uh, but there are vendors out there that will provide security team support or security support for the outdated software. But by and large, it's not community supported. Um, be careful using modules that don't have stable releases. They will have publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, potentially. Uh, work with the maintainers and try to get them to release a stable version of it. And then finally, this really big, bold uh, thing, take and verify backups. It's great if you take backups. It's great if you have your backups. If you've never actually tried to restore from your backups, your backups are useless. Because uh, the last time you want to try to figure out how to restore from backups is when you need your backups. So do an exercise. Ta assume your primary server got compromised and is offline. Restore your site to a secondary server. Now, if you're using a managed hosting provider, they likely do this for you. Ask them to prove that it works. Just say, hey, can you bring my site up online? I want you to show me that your backups are working. There are managed hosting providers that have backups, and oh, ooh, well, you forgot to be backing up your database. Oops. We got your code, though, so you're good, right? No. Uh, with... Security, make sure you keep your sites up to date. When there is a release of, a, of something and it's flagged as a security update, apply it. That doesn't just go for Drupal modules and themes and libraries. That actually goes for the entire stack. So if Apache comes out and says, hey, we got a new security release, and you're running Apache, you need to make sure to update Apache. If you're using a hosted vendor, make sure the hosted vendor updates Apache. Um, this is the easiest way to prevent yourself from getting compromised. It comes down to knowing your risk level. Um, your blog is likely to get compromised for the sole purpose of spam. No one's going to actually target your blog unless you happen to have a lot of traffic uh, with a you know sophisticated <laughs> target. People are going to target your are going to basically do drive-by attacks on your blog and see if they can get them. If you have a complex site with a million users, that's not a true statement. People will target you for the data you might have. So what, what is the, you know, the internal exercise I do with new sites is, what is the most valuable piece of data this site has, and what would happen if it became public? And that's kind of where you start thinking about these problems. What is the most valuable data I have, and if that were information were to become public, what would be the consequences to me? So, you know, we've got the School of Information website where I work. You know, the most private information on there are people's email addresses. Those email addresses are already public. If someone were to get the database of users, it would be embarrassing, but there's no credit card numbers, there's no social security numbers, there's no medical records. So it could be worse. Now, what's the worst thing about that site is if that site were to be compromised and somebody to put spam on the front page, that would be problematic. 
Uh, and that would be far more embarrassing than somebody getting the user's data. data. So you know, you're, 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 you're on an uphill treadmill against this. The question is how much time do you want to spend on the treadmill? And you just want to be slightly above the curve for your risk level. So the easiest way to be slightly above the curve is just start by keeping your site up to date. That's the easiest thing to start with. And if you've got complex data, if you've got data that's covered by an acronym, PCI, FISMA, FERPA, then you should be even more above the curve. But to start with, just know your own risk level. Don't use insecure hosting. Just don't do it. Um, it's more trouble than it's worth. So use a dedicated hosting provider or build one. Uh, if you're using cPanel, cPanel has its own security issues. It does have privilege separation, but it gives the web server access to write to the file system. And if you're running like Ubuntu or Red Hat and just running Apache or Nginx or something on there, all the sites on that server run as, as the same user. Um, with containers, this gets better, but containers have their own series of problems. Don't use multi-site. I know this is controversial. I can go hide behind the screen now if anybody like loves their multi-site sites. Um, if you're using multi-site to maintain a brand, such as you have, you know, Hospital A, Hospital B, and Hospital C, and they're all different domains, but it's somewhat the same content and it's the same admins, multi-site is okay. If you're using multi-site to provide Department A, Department B, and Department C, different sites, and if they're different admins, and they may not explicitly be trustworthy, one of those admins can compromise any other admin on, the, on that system. And so just be aware of that. That may be a risk you can accept. Great. It may not be. Um, use a module that enhances or promotes security in your site. And this is not an exact or an exhaustive list by any means. Paranoia, especially for Drupal 7 sites, is awesome. Uh, I will warn you, do not just go to your server and install Paranoia on your production site, especially if you've done non-standard things. It will break your site. Uh, it does things like prevent PHP from executing. It prevents itself from being disabled as well. So if you go into, the, you know, if you upload it to your file system and then you, you know, log in and you click the checkbox and you enable it and then you realize your site's broken, so you go back to your modules page to try to turn it off, it won't be there. Uh, it prevents itself from showing up. Security Review is a great module written by most of these security team members that goes through and it you know, runs some automated checks on your site. Permissions Lock is finer grain over what users with administered permissions can do. Two-factor authentication. This is one of the easiest things you can roll out to your site if you don't have some form of two-factor authentication uh, you should have some form of two-factor authentication on your site. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to use a Drupal module to do it. You can, you know, if you're forcing people to log in through Google, you can make Google do it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to provide this, ranging from the TFA module, which is uh, TFA and TFA basic uh, for Drupal 7 are free. You install them. It, you know, you generate a code on your phone. It just works. Uh, there's a Duo plugin for that. Um, that you can use Duo Security, which is really easy to use, and it's got push notifications and all sorts of fun things. It's not free, however. You can use the Google plugins to do it. It's just a really easy way to do things. Hacked basically does verification to see if the code on your file system has changed. It won't protect you from getting compromised, but it'll help you know if you have been. And password policy enforces strong passwords in Drupal 7. So one of the things that we think about is defense in depth and defense in breadth. I don't know if anybody's heard these terms before. But the idea is, is that we don't just have you know, one layer. We have multiple mechanisms to protect our security. So we have firewalls. We have you know, two-factor authentication. We have scripts that, modif 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 uh, that look for changes. We have multiple ways to protect our, seri our, our security. This, actually, this phrase actually comes from defending a castle. The castles would have multiple ways to protect the, uh, their security. They'd have a moat. They'd have hot lava they could pour on people's heads. They'd have places for people to stand to shoot people. Got very violent. Go watch Game of Thrones for more information. Um, <laughs> but you should think of your Drupal site of, you know, take, take the, what's called a red team idea and say, okay, 
What can I figure out about my site using publicly available tools? If I sat there and guessed passwords, would I be able to guess people's passwords? Try to actually compromise your own site, or better, pay someone else to try. Uh, especially if you've got sensitive data that people might want. It's, it's worth the time and energy to think through what would someone do? What can they figure out? Oh, they can figure out I'm running an outdated version of Drupal. I hope it's not Drupal uh, 7.31, which has SQL injection in it. Oops, my site's been compromised. Any questions? We have about eight minutes left. Yeah? So what if I take your advice and instead of self-hosting my site, I go to one of these dedicated Drupal web hosting agencies and they don't support Let's Encrypt? Um, so I think the majority of with the exception of maybe one of them, uh, the, and I'm not going to name names, the majority of them will give you a free SSL cert. Uh, some of them will, will let you upload your own SSL cert. Um, and so, you know, if they don't support Let's Encrypt, but they let you upload your own SSL cert, then you can actually generate your the Let's Encrypt cert locally and upload it. Unfortunately, you're going to have to do that every 90 days because the way Let's Encrypt works, but if you can write code, you can use their API to do this um, and actually generate the cert locally and then update it, upload it. Uh, you could ask them to take care of doing that for you um, because they are your managed provider. Uh, you can also, you know, put a CDN in front of it. So, you know, Cloudflare will offer free certs at their free level and you can, you know, you can get a cert through Cloudflare. It's not perfect because the data between Cloudflare and your provider won't be encrypted, but it's better than nothing. Especially if you have the ability on your provider end to prevent anything but Cloudflare servers from talking to it. So, you know, and Cloudflare also provides other, other things. And I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be appearing that I'm calling out a vendor specifically. Cloudflare, Fastly, Section.io, there's a ton of vendors that do this all at different price points, you, you, you should evaluate them and, and look for them. Uh, Cloudflare just has a lot of following around the Drupal community, so, but both of them are good. Fastly is another one. Fastly is actually uh, provides Drupal.org's CDN services, so we use Fastly on Drupal.org, and I'm pretty sure Pantheon just moved everybody over to Fastly as well. So, there, there's there's a lot of different service providers in the space that provide that. And with a CDN, you get other security protections such as denial of service prevention. Uh, you get caching, which is awesome because if you don't have caching, you're doing it wrong, uh, and all sorts of other tools in the in there. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, aside of the personal identifiable information, which is like a known target, mm -hmm. what are like Less, less common targets that you should also consider when thinking of what you need to protect? So, a um, couple things come to mind with that one. Uh, there was a website we held at, at XYZ Educational Institution where I happened to be employed um, <laughs> that uh, didn't have any personal identifiable information, but it helped you to write queries against a database. And so it appeared that people were after attacking that site for the API credentials to query that database. Um, because you know, that we, you know, there were settings.php, you could get settings.php, you could read them. The other thing that will happen often is you'll see a, 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 a external non-important <coughs> site compromised. So in the educational institutions, this would be like a lab website where you know maybe it gets 100 visitors a year, maybe. Uh, and what would happen is they would use that, but now they're sitting on an internal or at least a trusted IP address on your network. So it's the equivalent of being on a VPN. I'm now inside of that network. Well, so now I can start port scanning things and seeing what else I can find. So I'll use that as a pivot point to go someplace else. Or I'll get on that site, you know, let's say it's a, a medical lab website. And so, you know, somebody's doing research into something and they throw up this medical lab website. It's really quick. I'll compromise that site because it's probably somebody who's not maintaining it. And I'll just throw in a, a password logger. Well, now I'm sitting there, you know, it's not an important website, but there's a doctor who's going to log into that. Well, that doctor, once I have their password, because it's probably the same password they use everywhere, now I've got access to the University of Michigan's VPN. Once I've got access to the University of Michigan VPN, I know this person is a medical doctor, I can probably log into the electronic medical record system. Now, luckily, U of M has two-factor authentication, so you're going to get thwarted the two-factor authentication. 
hopefully. Um, but I can use these as pivot points to go elsewhere within my network. And so you'll see this happen frequently uh, where you know, I'll, get, I'll, I'll take the lowest common target and I will know that this is a system that I care about and I'll use it to pivot to something else. That's why we have air gap networks where they just don't touch the internet or any connected system. They're physically separated. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on uh, encrypting certain uh, data, data or data? So if you're dealing with HIPAA data, you have to encrypt data at rest. Um, that is a requirement of that standard. And there are services that do that for you. Uh, there's also ways to do that with open source software. You can also do it from the Drupal side where you actually encrypt the data when you put it into the database. Um, the problem with doing that generally, depending on how you configure it, is if Drupal has the ability to read and write data to the database and I can compromise Drupal, I can read and write data to the database. So if I'm going to encrypt the data when I put it into the database, that will protect me against somebody logging into the operating system or logging into the database server, dumping the database and trying to take it elsewhere because the data will be encrypted. But it's not going to prevent Drupal from getting compromised and being able to read it. There are a couple third-party modules that basically let you store your key in the cloud and they can <laughs> suck the data in and out. And so those are, are helpful, but... There's one solution where I saw that. I think put the private, uh, public, private key in the settings. Yep. But with, with, if, if, I can compromise, if I can get admin access on Drupal or PHP access, I can get to the private key. And that's the problem with that. So I think I'm supposed to stop now, but I'll stay up here for another minute or two and answer any other questions. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>